And good evening. It's uh, tr the Trinity Channel Live. Uh, Chris Conway here in our studios. And welcome to our program tonight. And with me in my, in our, in my studio, in our studio is, is uh, Tony Costa. Tony Costa. Tony Costa. Tony Costa. We've been sitting here for 45 minutes and I, I mispronounced <laughs> his last name. Sorry, Tony. That's okay. But I got Tony right. You got that okay. first part right. All <laughs> right. Well, Tony, uh, so glad to have you again in our studio. It's been a while since you and I yes. have worked together. And uh, it's an exciting time because it's our marathon. Yep. It's the second week of the Trinity Channel Marathon. And so much is going on and so much is happening and so much to discuss historically as well as current day events. Mm -hmm. And we're excited. Welcome to the program tonight. Uh, tonight, we also have with us via Skype, none other than uh, Robert Spencer. Robert, the director of Jihad Watch, are you there? I am here, Chris. How are you, sir? Great, sir. Glad to hear your, great to hear your voice and so excited to see you. And uh, we're looking forward to getting into this 90-minute program, which will uh, start right, we're starting right now. And tonight's topic happens to be, does Islam violate basic human rights? Does Islam violate basic human rights? And so we're going to get into that. Uh, I'm going to kind of get out of the way, but I would like to mention, first of all, thank you for watching tonight. Tonight's program will be at another exciting, interesting program. Two very, very knowledgeable, very well-respected, very well-read, and uh, very well-researched uh, uh, authors and speakers on Islam. Uh, Tony Costa being our uh, Christian apologist is in the house tonight. And then Robert Spencer, the director of Jihad Watch, as I mentioned. So they'll be doing most of the talking, but I did want to, again, thank everyone for watching and also know that because it's our marathon, we are continuing to remind our viewers and our listeners and anyone out there that we are uh, uh, asking for your prayer support, as, as you have in the past, as well as your financial support. You can always call us at this number, 248-416-1300. Again, 248-416-1300. We'll be mentioning that throughout the program tonight. Again, a 90-minute program, which starts right now. Gentlemen, uh, I'll get out of the way and have the two of you uh, get into tonight's topic. Oh, thank you so much, Chris, and, uh, and greetings to you as well, Robert, and uh, thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, so we're going to talk about human rights. Uh, do human rights, uh, are they violated by Islam? Because what we uh, hear in the media today is that uh, Sharia law is compatible with uh, Western uh, ideas of uh, democracy and that Sharia law is compatible uh, with uh, Western uh, government, whether it be the United States or Canada or, or Western Europe or Australia and so forth. But that's what we want to ask the question tonight is, does Islam violate the most basic human rights? And you know, when we talk about human rights, um, Chris and Robert, I'm sure you will agree, we're, we're talking about things like the right of uh, freedom of religion, uh, the freedom uh, to, to exercise one's religion, uh, the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, uh, the freedom of assembly, and, and particularly even women's rights, and so forth. And uh, is that something you hear occasionally, Robert, that uh, uh, Sharia law is, is compatible with, with uh, Western ideas of democracy, and that it does respect human rights? Is that uh, something of a mantra that you keep hearing? Oh, yes, very much so, Tony. As a matter of fact, there's a general steady stream of mainstream media articles asserting this and uh, claiming this on pain of charges of Islamophobia and bigotry, if you disagree. And uh, it seems to be something that the mainstream media is intent on reinforcing. And of course, the weakness of the position is the reason why they have to keep reinforcing it. For the main problem with this, the problem that I think we should start out at the outset in discussing, is that Muslim countries themselves disagree with the proposition that Islam is compatible with Western notions of human rights. And we see that from the fact that in 1948, the UN issued the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, this was a flawed document. For one thing, it gave the impression that these rights were given by governments and not by God. Mm -hmm. uh, but aside from that, it is a generally useful document delineating what human rights generally are. And these are the ones that you mentioned, the freedom of speech, the equality of rights of all people before the law, the freedom of conscience, and so on. They're all in there. Now, the Muslim countries, some of them signed on to this. But then the majority of Muslim countries in the world gathered many years later in Cairo. And they issued what became known as the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. And the first statement in the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights is that 
human beings have only the rights that are given to them by Islamic law. And that is, human rights must be understood within the context of and parameters granted by Sharia, Islamic law. Mm-hmm. And so there really isn't any idea of human rights except what is given in Sharia, and that means the denial of the freedom of conscience, the denial of the equality of rights of all people before the law, the denial of the freedom of speech, and so on, the de- systematic devaluation and dehumanization of women and non-Muslims, all of this. And all of it is affirmed in the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights, to which I believe all or most Muslim countries signed on to, as opposed to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the UN. Mm-hmm. There's also a great deal more that shows this. For example, the uh, uh, stipulations in Islamic law regarding the blood money that's to be paid if someone is killed. In Islamic law, if, some, if you kill someone, you don't necessarily go to jail for murder. You can pay the relatives of the deceased a certain amount, uh, and then you're free. That's it. And, of course, they have to agree to it. But if they agree to it, then there are also further stipulations in regard to how much is to be paid. And if you are a person who killed a Muslim male, then you have to pay a certain amount. If you kill a Muslim woman, then you have to pay less. If you kill a person who is a member of a group considered to be part of the people of the book, Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, etc., then you would pay less than you would pay for having killed a Muslim, but you would uh, still be paying more than you would pay if you were guilty of killing somebody who was a Hindu or a Buddhist or some other group that's not the people of the book. And so by that stipulation, which is found in all the schools of Islamic jurisprudence, you have the basic devaluation of the human life of non-Muslims and of women. And this runs directly against the core principles of the Western notions of human rights, which of course come from the Judeo-Christian tradition and the idea of all people being equal in created equal in dignity before God. Right. And I think uh, I would be correct to say, uh, Robert, that the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights uh, said that uh, that uh, the charter, the original charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations was subject to the Sharia. I think there was yes. a clause in there that it was subject to the Sharia. And you've also mentioned a very interesting point there, uh, Robert, about um, being labeled an Islamophobe. And of course, this is a term that uh, has become uh, almost a, a, a term to blackball anyone who would say anything critical uh, of Islam. And so... Um, I'm sure you've been called a greasy Islamophobe, as I have. And, and of course, do these words have any merit, uh, Robert, or are they just pejorative terms that we simply fling at each other to, to silence us? Oh, yeah, very much so. The term Islamophobia is used by supporters of jihad terror and supporters of the whole Islamic supremacist agenda in order to not uh, only silence all criticism of jihad terror, but to discredit it so that people are afraid they're intimidated. They think there's something wrong with speaking out against jihad terror. And this is, of course, a very dangerous road to go down. In the first place, it's inimical to free speech, free inquiry, and free discourse. But also, it will just enable the advance of jihad terror unimpeded. One primary example of this is uh, a young man in uh, uh, New Jersey, I believe it is, who was working at a video store when some of the Fort Dix jihad plotters came in with videotapes. Now, at Fort Dix, there was a foiled plot a few years back where Islamic jihadis had planned to go into the army base and kill as many American soldiers as possible before they themselves were killed, thereby hoping to gain the benefits of the Quran's promise of paradise to those who kill and are killed for Allah in chapter 9, verse 111. Mm-hmm. So they, the thing is that they, they foiled their own plot when they went into this video store and they asked the young man at the desk to transfer their VHS tapes to DVD. So he was doing the job and it turned out that these were gory jihad videos, beheadings and bombings and so on, that they liked to watch. They enjoyed this kind of thing. But the uh, young man was very uh, alarmed and he went to his boss. Now, listen carefully to what he said to his boss. He said, "Uh, should I report this to the police? Or would that be racist? Mm. See, he's been, he's, it's been drummed into his head probably right. all his life. He was 17 at the time. That there's something wrong with 
standing up to jihad terror, that there's something bigoted and racist about it. This is the whole idea of Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of charging somebody with Islamophobia is designed to stigmatize them as being some kind of irrational, hateful bigot, and thereby to clear away all obstacles to the advance of jihad terror, so that people like this young man in the video store will be too scared to go to the police, which he, to his credit, ultimately did, because they'll be afraid of being labeled as racist and bigoted and so on. Right. And it's funny that, that the word phobia usually means an irrational fear of something. And to, to, uh, to have a rational fear of something in terms of, of protection, I think, is a good thing. Uh, but, but it was also the OIC, the, uh, the Organization of the Islamic uh, Congress or Council, I believe, at the UN that came up with the term Islamophobia. Well, you know, the, it, it's, uh, it's a funny thing, Tony, that when you get into this deeply, you see uh, people saying, Oh, no, it was first used in some obscure book in French in 1910 or something. And uh, uh, there are all sorts of claim, claims that it was used uh, previous to its adoption by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is what the uh, OIC calls itself now. They kept the same initials but changed the name from Organization of the Islamic Conference to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Anyway, it's the same group. And they have an, what they call an Islamophobia Observatory. And in any case, whether they developed the word and invented the word or not, they're certainly using it as a club to beat uh, opponents of jihad terror with. And, of course, it's very effective, but it's only effective because the mainstream media and even Western governments give it credence and act as if it were a real thing. And they conflate vigilante attacks against innocent Muslims, which, of course, are always reprehensible and always to be condemned, with legitimate inquiry into how Islamic jihadis use the texts and teachings of Islam to justify violence and supremacism, mm -hmm. with the implication being that if you look into how Islam, Islamic texts incite and inspire violence, then you must be the same kind of person as somebody who goes and, 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 and beats an innocent Muslim on the head because he's a Muslim. And of course, the idea there here again is to inhibit any criticism and any inquiry into how Islam inspires jihad terror. Right, right. And for our viewers, uh, those, of, those of you in the United States, let me remind you of the immortal words of the uh, U.S. Constitution. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women, of course, are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And they go on to point out what those rights are, liberty and so forth, the pursuit of happiness. Now, uh, of course, as Robert mentioned, uh, the, the foundation of these rights is, again, the Judeo-Christian principle that sees man as the image of God and, therefore, that he is endowed with these rights, these inalienable rights. Now, being a Canadian, I have to show my bias. I, I also want to say that in our uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, we have this, whereas Canada is founded upon the principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law, they mention here the freedom of conscience and religion, freedom of thought, belief, opinion, expression, including freedom of the press and other media of communication, freedom of peaceful assembly, and freedom of association. And so our great countries are built upon these premises that the Judeo-Christian Foundation guarantees these freedoms. Um, and um, it's quite interesting that just in recent weeks, uh, Robert, you're aware of this, and Chris, that in, in my country of Canada, in our capital city of Ottawa, we we had uh, a, a convert to Islam uh, kill a soldier at one of the most sacred places in, our, in the country of Canada, the, the, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And, and then he proceeded to enter the Parliament buildings in Ottawa, in Parliament Hill, uh, with the intention, no doubt, of killing the Prime Minister and other members of, of, the, of the, the government. And then he was uh, shot down. And then uh, a few days before that, in Montreal, uh, we had a soldier that was uh, run down uh, and killed uh, as well. And so... Uh, this is not something that is alien to either one of our countries, and we're seeing this getting progressively worse. And, and Robert, you, you've been following this in the media. Um, I, I'm thankful to God for a prime minister like Stephen Harper in Canada who called it for what it was, that it was a terrorist act. But don't you find that Western governments uh, like David Cameron and even the President of the United States, Barack Obama, continue to uh, try to uh, save face with Islam and, and argue that, uh, that this is not the work of, of of Islam. These are just extremists. Some of them say they're mentally ill and so forth. Do you find that there continues to be this whitewashing, this smokescreen of, of what the Islamic texts are actually saying? Oh, very much so. Very much so, Tony. Uh, 
it's it's really shameful that uh, just recently, a few months ago, of course, there was a beheading in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. and the uh, beheader he had on his Facebook page pictures of Osama bin Laden and the Taliban, and pic- a graphic photo of a beheading. <clears throat> Excuse me, of a beheading in progress, which was uh, captioned underneath with one of the Quran verses sanctioning beheading, uh, chapter 8, verse 12, where Allah tells the angels to go and strike the necks of the unbelievers. Then in chapter 47, verse 4, he tells the believers to strike the necks of the unbelievers. Anyway, he has this on his Facebook page. He goes and beheads one of his co-workers. Hmm. It's clear that he was inspired by the beheadings of the Islamic State, inspired by Quranic teaching to take this action. Uh, And yet the Obama administration and uh, the mainstream media and all of them characterized it as an act of workplace violence because he had been suspended from his job. They did not mention that he was suspended from his job after a heated argument over whether stoning adulterers was uh, a a proper thing to do. And he was arguing the yes, and then some of his co-workers were saying, no, that's barbaric. Uh, this is not to condone adultery, but it's not to say that uh, it's something someone should be stoned to death for it. Uh, these things are left up to the judgment of God properly. But in this case, uh, he went home, he got a knife, he came back, he beheaded one of his co-workers, and then was in the process of attacking and beheading another when he was stopped. This was clearly had this clearly had everything to do with his admiration for jihad terror groups and his imbibing of the Quranic teaching regarding beheading of unbelievers. But the denial of the administration and the mainstream media in that regard was just as strong in this case as it was during the Fort Hood Jihad massacre in 2009, which was also classified as workplace violence, mm-hmm. and uh, completely ignoring in that case also how the Fort Hood Jihad murderer had explained that he was doing this in the name of Islam and in the name of Jihad. The problem with this denial, of course, is that it uh, forecloses on any possibility that we will understand the enemy properly. Mm. You can't defeat an enemy that you don't understand. And in America, it's not even uh, accepted as, it's not even part of the accepted public discourse to speak honestly about who these people are, what their goals are, and how we can best counter them. Right. And it's an interesting as well in Jerusalem, uh, we had uh, the, uh, a Palestinian member, a member of Hamas who uh, uh, struck a number of, uh, of people waiting for the, the, the train and uh, you, the, uh, a three-month-old baby, I believe, was killed. And if I'm not mistaken, the U.S. consulate uh, there in Jerusalem said that it was a traffic accident. They reduced it to a yes, traffic accident. Yes, traffic incident, yes. Yeah, which again yes. is, is incredible that, uh, and this is coming, of course, from the top. Uh, coming uh, from the top. Uh, But a bit of history for those who are joining in, a bit of history. You may not know this, but the founding fathers of the United States knew all too well about Islam. Uh, You may not know this, but uh, many of the the creation of the U.S. Navy was uh, related to uh, the fact that in the Mediterranean, many of the U.S. naval ships were being attacked by marauding pirates, uh, Muslim pirates who were uh, demanding uh, jizya and, and payment and so forth. And and so Thomas Jefferson and, and, and Adams, for instance, uh, spoke about these people and how their religion calls on them to wage war against their enemies and how they ought to pay a, a special uh, poll tax and so forth. Um, Robert, did, did, uh, do you have anything to share on that as well, about the founding fathers of the United States and their experiences with these marauding uh, pirates? Well, you, uh, you, your point is very, it's, it's interesting to note that when you say that Jefferson explained, as he, as he uh, certainly did, about how the uh, Muslim emissaries from the Barbary pirates told him that they were commanded in the Quran, their holy book, to wage war against unbelievers. And uh, that this was why they were doing what they were doing. And so America's first wars were jihad wars fought against jihadi pirates. But uh, it's interesting to note how these things have become so politicized and manipulated today and how uh, Islamic jihadis and Islamic supremacists are even trying to rewrite history that nowadays the fact that Thomas Jefferson owned a Quran and it was in his library and found there uh, of course upon his death uh, is being spun as if he were some sort of proto-multiculturalist and as if he had uh, some kind of a view that was in favor of or uh, 
uh, favorable toward Islam and jihad, when actually he pro he almost certainly had the Quran in order to abide by that ancient adage of warfare, know your enemy. And he uh, was probably able to compile his report explaining how the uh, emissary had told him that the Quran mandates warfare against unbelievers, knowing that what the emissary said was true because he was able to see it for himself. And so uh, you see Jefferson, who is somebody who spoke honestly about Islamic Jihad terror, being spun now into uh, some sort of a uh, 19th century Barack Obama or David Cameron uh, saying that uh, Islam was peaceful and wonderful. Even these iftar Ramadan dinners that have been uh, celebrated at the White House since 9-11, actually. George W. Bush started them after 9-11 to show that we were not at war with the Islamic world and had a favorable view of Islam in the United States. Now uh, it's being sent around that Thomas Jefferson actually had the first iftar dinner for Ramadan in the White House when he entertained an ambassador from one of these uh, Mediterranean North African countries that were waging war against the United States. Now, in fact, uh, he had the man to dinner, and it was Ramadan, but it was not a Ramadan <laughs> iftar. It was a <laughs> dinner to negotiate over how they were going to settle the uh, terms of the, 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 the ending of the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was all it was, to act as if uh, uh, Jefferson was, was uh, some sort of a uh, precursor to these uh, bemused and uh, self-deluded multiculturalists who think that uh, we're way beyond warfare and way beyond these ancient hatreds nowadays, and so we can lay down all our defenses and we know that our enemies, will, our historic and ancient enemies, will do the same. Well, that's... Uh, uh, either naivete or cynicism, or perhaps a measure of a bit of both. Right. right. Well, you know, Robert and, and, and Tony, this is fascinating. We're, we're, we're coming up on our first break, but we, before we do that, we actually do have a caller, and we'd like to take that call right now, and then we'll be going right to break. So uh, I'm not sure who, who's calling in, but uh, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, hello, sir. What's your question? Uh, my name is Philip, and I've taken part uh, in these programs uh, a few times, Excellent. and I'm so glad to meet uh, uh, Mr. R R uh, uh, Robert Spencer. I'm a great admirer of him. He's a walking encyclopedia. He's not only a walking encyclopedia, he's also a talking encyclopedia. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, I just wanted to say about the Bombay shooting, which took place, I think, when the, when the year Mr. Obama got elected, Bombay shootings, you know what happened? And the Pakistanis infiltrated to the city of Bombay and opened fire and killed innocent people mm -hmm. in the name of Islam. Mm -hmm. So Islam is a tyrannical religion. Uh, 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 we cannot say it's a religion. It's a, it's a political system mm -hmm. which wants to subdue all people of this world and make uh, Darul Harb into Darul Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, it, these politicians and these leftist press, we cannot trust them because they are misleading people. And they are... Uh, uh, naive, if they, they are not naive, they are, uh, they are uh, using people's ignorance to perpetrate Islam directly or indirectly. So we cannot trust all these people. Programs like uh, what your channel broadcasts are very important. You do your good job and, and propagate the evils of the religious political system called Islam and let the world come to know about it so that Islam will be put to an end. Uh, but very soon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the winner. It's going to put an end to Islam. That's what we see now. Islam is rapidly falling down. And, 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 and the reaction of the, 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 uh, the, their uh, falling down uh, is the, it, it, that what leads to terrorism. You know, as uh, Dr. Bill, Bill Warner says, we are looking at the fruits of Islam because its roots are, uh, are, are, are based on terrorism and tyranny and subduing people. So please do a good job, and I, I want to salute uh, Robert Spencer. Uh, he's doing a great job, and he's a, great, he's, a, he's a champion for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, exposing Islam. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. Philip, for, for calling. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, and uh, I would concur. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's also important to, to note that 
Uh, we've not been at war with Islam just in the, in the re recent decades or so. Yes. We've been yes, at we war with Islam for 1,400 years. It was declared yes. on us when Muhammad said, I've been commanded to fight against the people until yeah. they confess that there is no God but Allah and that I am his messenger. And so it's very clear that the declaration of war was made 1,400 years ago. And that war has been ongoing and getting progressively more and, uh, more, and more worse as we see today. Yeah, I have one more coming. Okay, we've got a couple more minutes, but go ahead, Philip. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 all the freedom-loving people have to join together. Earlier, when we dealt against uh, Nazism and communism, we had a clear-cut uh, understanding uh, of the adversary, and we had a, uh, a very straight program, uh, you know, to counter the uh, onslaught of communism and Nazism. But unfortunately, to 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 counter the Islamic, uh, uh, you know, Islamic uh, expand, Islamic uh, 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 way of dealing things, uh, I don't think America has a clear strategy. Recently, the president made a statement saying that he. And America doesn't have a clear policy to de deal with ISIS. That shows the weakness of America. That shows that America is not able to define its, uh, the, the Islamic enemy. Um, uh, so that shows clearly the weakness of this administration. I'm so sorry to talk about it. We should know exactly what Islam is all about. Uh, but ABN understands that. And ABN propagates the real nature of Islam. So let us define what Islam is. And once we know the position of Islam, and once we are clear what Islam is all about, then we can find a, a, an effective strategy to stop the spreading of the evil religio-political system called Islam. That's and my th comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. And that Thank includes you, uh, joining yeah. with, with passionate viewers like yourself and, and people that are find, uh, yeah. continuing to track what's going on. We're going to take a quick break right now. Yeah, uh, but we'll be right back. We've got another uh, one hour or so left in our program, so stick with, stick with us. And if you if you haven't uh, done so, uh, feel free to call a friend or invite someone to join you as as we watch the rest of this program. Again, we're going to a, a quick break. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> And welcome back, and thank you for sticking with us. Again, another hour or so with uh, Tony Costa and uh, Robert Spencer. And we've got a, we still got our open lines at 248-416-1300. And we are accepting phone calls as well as uh, any donations, again, that you would wish to uh, provide for our programming. It's programs like this that are a result of your generous giving. We are so grateful to God to be able to bring forth these programs and to provide the crew and all the equipment and the broadcast equipment, all the things necessary, the cameras, the lighting, the microphones, uh, all of the switching gears, all the, all the switching gears, all the equipment that we have, the, the bright lights that blink and all the things that are required. Much of that 
is put, uh, put forth by your efforts, your financial, generous financial giving. And we're asking that you consider again this, at this time uh, as we are in the uh, midst of our marathon for, for viewers out there to consider participating uh, again in, in, in a donation. Uh, the tax-deductible tax uh, donation of any amount, whether it's a one-time or a regular gift, we would really appreciate that. And continue, consider to, to consider to or continue to consider, I should say, uh, doing that. And again, the number is two four eight four one six thirteen hundred. If I can spit that out, sorry about that. Either way, just know that we do appreciate it. We uh, do have a couple more callers. We have one on the phone right now, and we'll take that caller, and then we're going to have. Uh, uh, Tony and Robert uh, answer the question. This caller is Isam, I believe. Isam, are you there? Hello. 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 Uh, what's your question, sir? Uh, my name's Robert, but uh, okay. Yes, I'm uh, sorry, Robert. Okay. Uh, I was just thinking. I mean, I believe. I well, I didn't really think this much until I started watching y'all, but I do think that the Muslims need to be evangelized. But um. Thinking back in history and thinking back to, to, to Black Jack Pershing, and uh, I know it sounds, you know, hateful, and I don't mean it hateful, but isn't Islam kind of vulnerable to sort of like their own tactics? I mean, say, for instance, uh, a Hindi terrorist decided that he was going to go to what is that black stone they think so much of and uh, suicide bomb himself there with a nuke, you know, some kind of thing like that and vaporize their little space there. I mean, wouldn't that pretty much end their religion? Hmm. May I answer? Yes. Am I still here? Yes. I, I, I don't think it would. In the first place, I don't think we should use their tactics to combat them. Uh, there's some terrible feedback on the line. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's very distracting. Uh, in any case, I'll still try to explain this. Um, the uh, we, we should not use their tactics to respond to them because if we do then what's the point of even responding we have to stand for humane values and for human rights and for the uh, Christian tradition the Judeo-Christian tradition that teaches the dignity of human beings before God otherwise I totally, no totally agree but uh, if you're you know you don't look at this as a war I don't know what y'all look at it as but it's, it's war, ever there's... apparent to me that it almost seems like it's becoming a war I mean God forbid oh, it, that it does but it, it would just seem to me that there would be a whole lot less casualties if they took that little space out and didn't try to fight, you know, a billion of them. Robert, well, let's, oh, let's Mr. Spencer work. respond to that. It wouldn't work. Uh, the, the fact is that the stone, the black stone that's in the Kaaba, it was stolen by the Shiites at a time uh, in the Middle Ages when the uh, Sunni-Shiite divide was very hot and they were waging war against each other. A Shiite group actually stole the black stone and took it away for 40 years. Islam did not collapse. It went on. And they put the stone back later. Uh, these kinds of things have happened before. Also, people think, you know, you mentioned Pershing, and I know that there's that widely circulated uh, story about how Pershing had the bullets uh, dipped in pig's blood or pig fat or whatever it was before he uh, had them used on uh, Muslims who were going to be executed. And this ended all jihad activity. I don't think that that story is accurate. I don't know directly about General Pershing, but I do know uh, from direct evidence that uh, people have tried to do these kinds of things, uh, put pork around mosques and so on. I don't approve of that. I don't approve of the, these kinds of actions of uh, obnoxiousness and being offensive and so on. Uh, but also I know they don't work. and. Uh, They've been proven not to work, that instead of closing up the mosque or not building the mosque where the pork was put, the Muslims just ignored it and went on. And so uh, these ideas that these things would end all this easily, it, it, it's, it's nice to think that that might be the case, but unfortunately experience shows that it wouldn't work that way. And, any, and, and I must conclude by reiterating, we should not act in that way, those kinds of ways in any case. Oh yeah, I don't. I, I was just kind of always had that on the back of my mind as to what would happen, and uh, I didn't know about the Pershing story either. But on a legal setting, I mean, if their religion comes in in conflict with our constitution, is there anything legal that our government can do to kind of 
you know, maybe well, late. Uh, there are sedition laws in the United States, and I'm sure Tony can explain that there are in Canada as well. Uh, there, there are laws against overthrowing the government there are laws uh, there are uh, there's the oath that every elected official takes to protect the constitution of the united states and preserve it and so on uh, these kinds of things could be used i think and should be used to fight against every aspect of islamic law that's at variance with constitutional freedoms and notions of human rights but will they be used absolutely not not in the current political climate uh, any suggestion to that effect is just waved away as Islamophobic and bigoted. And there's no idea of protecting the freedom of speech, the freedom of conscience, the equality of rights of all people. None of that matters anymore. The only thing that matters is to accommodate uh, Muslims. You've you got to wonder when you see this being so universally prescribed and universally followed, if uh, maybe there's oil money behind it and People's pockets are being greased. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that there is necessarily, but certainly something is going on because all the Western leaders, all the Western governments, with the arguable exception of Prime Minister Harper in Canada, all of the uh, elected officials in Britain, in the U.S., in Europe, both parties in the United States, the Democrats, the Republicans, they all sign on to this idea that Islam is a religion of peace. It's perfectly benign. We should welcome more and more Muslims into the country. Uh, there's no consideration of any possibility of the incompatibility of Sharia with Western notions of human rights or with constitutional freedoms, and it's universal. It, it, there's nobody on the other side. Nobody. Hmm. You, you, you got to wonder. You know, uh, either we're just very wrong on this program, and I don't think we are, or uh, there's something else going on. I'm not given to conspiracy theories, and I'm not saying there is one, but uh, certainly something must account for. Uh, the, 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 the universality of this response. And I think maybe it's just as simple as that people are afraid of being charged, charred as bigoted. And when the uh, Islamic supremacist groups in the West started claiming that any resistance to jihad terror was hatred and bigotry, maybe they found the golden key in that regard and uh, were able to get everybody behind them. But they certainly do have everybody behind them. And we think also of the words of uh, President Barack Obama at the United Nations, where he said, the future does not belong to those who insult the prophet of Islam. And right there, that was, he just uh, capped freedom of speech right there. But why the prophet of Islam? Why not Jesus? Why not Moses or any other revered uh, figure? But it's interesting that the President of the United States said, the future does not belong to those who uh, insult the prophet of Islam. So there is no... Uh, there is no opportunity to question them. I mean, uh, Robert wrote an excellent book on did Muhammad exist. That would be considered as an insult in the Muslim world. Uh, a German professor who was a convert to Islam uh, was threatened when he proposed that uh, Muhammad most likely did not exist. And now apparently he's apostatized from Islam. Uh, but would that not be true, uh, Robert? When the president of the United States of America states at the UN that the future does not belong to those who... Uh, who insult the Prophet of Islam, has he not effectively reneged on the U.S. Constitution? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're in the very strange position now, Tony, of having a president of the United States and an administration that is opposed to the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he clearly would rather that the First Amendment went away, and he's been chipping away at it with, uh, with the idea of hate speech and hate crime laws. Uh, Obviously, any real hate and any any real hate crime is something that any any individual should oppose. But the problem is when you start talking about hate crimes. Well, what makes something a hate crime? If I come and beat you up and take your money, that's a crime. If I come and beat you up and take your money and call you uh, some nasty name that uh, you know some name for Canadian or something, then that makes it worse, right? Then it's a hate crime, right? Well, actually, you're just as beat up and you're just as bereft of your money. And maybe you're a little bit insulted or uh, 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 your feelings are hurt or so on, but, you know, it, 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 it amazes me how immature these things are all. Uh, it, people get insulted and, 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 and uh, uh, have to put up with things they don't like every day. But if you're in these one of these groups, and Muslims are one of the groups, that is, uh, it's considered to be a hate crime if you insult them and with, with some slur, then the crime that you commit, might commit against them becomes that much more heinous. So, in other words, the point of the hate crime legislation depends upon the concept of hate speech. Mm -hmm. that you're, it's what you're saying that makes it a hate crime. 
And when you, when you cross that line, you've crossed a very, very dangerous line because you've really, uh, now you've, you've got no free speech at all. I was speaking at uh, Cal Poly, the California Polytechnic University in San Luis Obispo, California, lovely little town, uh, last uh, spring. And there was a, a very angry young woman in the crowd who during the Q&A, she said to me, uh, that this said ne should never have been allowed, this talk by me, and that it was hate speech, and that hate speech is not free speech. And I saw the same thing when the uh, uh, University of California Berkeley students tried to get Bill Maher, the comedian, mm -hmm. uh, canceled from giving the commencement address at the fall commencement in December, just recently. And I saw the same thing again. Hate speech is not free speech. This is a very pernicious and dangerous idea. And it is getting more and more currency. The idea, of course, it's very straightforward. If you are, are inciting hatred and violence against people, then you cannot be allowed to speak. And that goes beyond the bounds of accepted parameters of freedom of speech. Put that way, a lot of people would go for it. A lot of people would say, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Absolutely. No more hate speech. The problem is then, who gets to decide what hate speech is? Yeah. Who gets, who, which government official uh, looks at what I say or what you say or what Osama bin Laden said, or what Islamic Jihad leaders today say, and decides this is hate speech, this is not, this is acceptable, this isn't. That person, whoever he is, has extraordinary power. And you have effectively placed the freedom of speech into his or her hands. Now, the difficulty with that is that nowadays you have the Islamic supremacist advocacy groups, like the Hamas linked Council on American Islamic Relations and others, essentially labeling every and all criticism of jihad terror and any realistic examination of how Islamic jihadis use the Islamic teachings to justify the terror as hate speech. And then that means that, you know, if they have the power, and they do right now, then they can get it all outlawed and absolutely prescribed under the law, proscribed that is, under the law, to, and forbidden to speak critically about Islam and jihad. Now that's the insidious Backstory, when Osama, when uh, oh yikes, Osama bin Laden. No, when Barack Obama <laughs> says the future must not belong to those who slander the Prophet of Islam, that's what he's saying. That it ought to be outside the bounds of acceptable speech. It ought to be considered hate speech and not free speech to say something that Muslims don't like about Muhammad. Instead, he should have said if he had any real appreciation for the First Amendment, or even any awareness of his responsibility as President of the United States to uphold his oath of office, which in which he solemnly swore to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. He would have gotten to, gone to the UN and said, instead of saying, the future must not belong to those who slander the Prophet of Islam, he would have said, the future must not belong to those who try to curtail the freedom of speech of others through intimidation or violence or the future must not belong to those who smear and defame others simply for exercising their freedom of speech and having an opinion that's unpopular. He could have said and should have said, as a decent president of the United States, something like that. But instead, he's now gone on record as being opposed to the Constitution he swore to protect and defend. And of course, with Ben Affleck and Bill Maher, uh, of course, Ben Affleck uh, accused him of being a racist. And we've been wondering, uh, Robert, as you probably have, what in the world, what race is Islam? Uh, it's Islam, the Islam is not a race. Islam. Yes. Islam is the, not a race. Uh, yes. Uh, it's a funny thing because uh, I myself am uh, from a family from the Middle East, and uh, my family lived in the Islamic world for uh, the whole time of that Islam was there until they were exiled. Uh, and... Ibrahim Hooper of the Council on American Islamic Relations is a blonde haired, blue eyed uh, fellow of Scandinavian descent from Wisconsin or Minnesota or somewhere. And, uh, you know, you got to wonder if I uh, criticize him, I'm the racist. And yet, uh, well, anyway, you see the, the paradox here. Islam is obviously something, a belief system that's held by people of all races, by people of all colors, right. by people right. of all kinds of uh, cultural backgrounds. They, uh, you can find Muslims of, of, of every ethnicity. And so to act as if it's racist, well, this is playing, of course, upon the popular 
perception and the fact that most Muslim immigrants are uh, from uh, Pakistan, from Syria, from Egypt, from places that uh, 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 people would consider, well, they're not white or something like that. You know, right. these are right. distinctions in themselves are artificial. But, uh, but in any case, the uh, idea is that uh, to, it's just some sort of a white supremacist enterprise to keep down the brown people. And, uh, you know, when I see Ibrahim Uper on TV, uh, I always wonder why it's racist to oppose him. Uh, or, or maybe we could get white non-Muslims to oppose Ibrahim Hooper and brown non-Muslims to oppose brown Muslims, and maybe that would be not racist. But of course, that wouldn't uh, cut the uh, cut the mustard either, because it's all a cynic, cynical and deceptive endeavor here again to quash any criticism of jihad terror and Islamic supremacism. Right. You know, we need to do a program that we we'll just title it "The Curiosity of Chris," because I'm <laughs> listening to this. I'm writing these, all these notes, but, you know, it's not for me to ask the questions, I, uh, but I, there's so many, and it's so interesting, and there's so many things that are going on. But I think we still have a caller, actually. If I'm not mistaken. If we do, we would like to take that call right now. If we have a caller on the line for either Robert or Tony, is there someone there? Maybe I'm mistaken. I thought we No, had... you're not mistaken. No. Oh, here we go. Ah, uh, yes, yes. This is for Robert. Robert, we do wish to be humane. Okay, now you did uh, reference Surah 9, verse 111, which says the highest sacrament uh, or the surety of getting into Jannah is to kill others in Allah's name, and to be killed doing so, or to be killed doing so. That's not a necessity. As you well know, that's not a one-time promise. That also occurs at 4, Surah 4, verse 74, or Ayah 74. And it is mentioned and alluded to numerous other times, such as Surah 61, verses 10 through 12. Anyway, what we're talking about is the being humane to these. And, okay, if someone is a Muslim, by definition, they are submitted to Allah, and they follow the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad. That includes all of these things. Now... If we try, if we try to separate people, we are in the, We put ourselves into the situation of searching out the good Nazis. Do you not agree or disagree? And could you please give a reason? Uh, I, I'm not even sure I understand the question. I didn't say anything about searching out good Muslims or anything of the kind. Uh, what I said was we have to uh, be upholding our own values. In response, you know, I don't know if you're a Christian, sir, but uh, the Lord said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I do not believe that that is some sort of a recipe for being a doormat and lying down in front of your enemies and not doing anything uh, to defend yourself or your family. I believe we have an obligation in charity, as a matter of fact, to defend our homelands and our families and our loved ones and so on. Uh, but not to do so with an eye toward revenge, but simply with an eye toward justice. Mm -hmm. And that is in sharp dichotomy to Surah 4829 in the Quran, which says, Muhammad is the apostle of Allah, and those who follow him are merciful to one another, but ruthless to the unbelievers. And so if we are ruthless to those outside our own fold, then we are obeying the Quran and not the uh, Lord in the Gospel of Matthew. And I think that would be a very grave mistake for a Christian to make. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, sir. We, yeah. we uh, they appreciate that. Tony, would like to comment on, on that? No, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what, mm -hmm. uh, with what Robert just said, and that is really the essence. The message of Jesus, contrasted with Muhammad, is that Jesus said, love your enemies, pray for those who despitefully use you. He who lives by the sword will die by the sword or perish by the sword. Muhammad was the exact opposite. You love those who are your own, but hate those who are outside of you, even if they are close to you. So uh, they are worlds apart. Right. And we're on the winning side. I'm so grateful Absolutely. for that. Oh, and uh, so we do have another caller, I believe. Uh, I believe this time it is Isam. Isam, are you there? Hello? Hello? Yes. It's, uh, you're on the air, yes. sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Chris and Tony and Robert and uh, people that are not there, especially Mr. Wood and CL and everybody else. Thank you so much for, for what you do. Well, uh, I am from Pakistan, 
and and uh, there is no such thing human rights for Christians. And I am I am by the grace of God I am Christian. <clears throat> and in Pakistan there is no such thing that's called human rights. The country is predominantly Muslim. And the Islamic law or Sharia law is constantly is being used or abused or misused, whatever you want to call it. And people, the Christian people, are being subjected to killing and all kinds of unfairness means that are applied in the name of Sharia. Uh, just a few days ago, we found, we got a news that a young couple was burned alive just because they were accused of burning two pages from the Quran, which is a complete lie. But the mob, Muslim mob, they surrounded that little family. They have three kids. And uh, police is watching there. Police is right there watching what's going down. They burned this couple alive. There is no such thing human rights. Islam does not have any human rights. And my question is, or request is, what can U.S. do to push that government to get rid of this Sharia law that has been a big, huge problem and violation of human rights all around? And everybody knows it, including Barack Obama. He knows it. What's going on there? But nobody says anything at all. Please help us. In this, in this issue, this is causing huge trouble. And anybody that speaks against this law in our country, in Pakistan, gets killed. And that involved, just a year and a half ago, one of the governor of Punjab spoke against this law. He was assassinated by his own bodyguard. And instead of um, calling him a murderer, they call him a hero and give him a special, special uh, place in their lives, and he's a hero of the nation because he killed a uh, infidel. So now, what can be done? <clears throat> Is there any way this U.S. government would force Pakistani government, Nawaz Sharif, to get rid of this law? And I'll take your answer off here, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Robert, would you like to take that question? or? Yeah, there's one very simple thing that could be done and should be done. And uh, as a matter of fact, it was proposed by uh, the Pakistani Christian leader, uh, I believe his name is Nawaz Bhatti. Uh, in any case, he just uh, proposed this the other day. He wrote a letter to Obama saying that uh, the aid to Pakistan should be tied to the blasphemy law, that there should be no aid to Pakistan as long as the blasphemy law remained in place. Uh, Nazir, yeah, sorry for getting his name wrong, Nazir S. Bhatti, the president of the Pakistan Christian Congress, and uh, he wrote this wonderful letter to Obama pointing out about the burning of the couple that uh, the caller mentioned and uh, saying that Obama should tie aid to Pakistan to their repeal of the blasphemy law. Of course, Obama's never going to do this, but if he were to, then that would take care of the blasphemy law very quickly because Pakistan gets well over a billion dollars every year from the United States. It depends on this money, and it's as simple as that. In the early part of the 20th century, the Islamic world was much more westernized than it is now, and much more secular. And this was because the West was more powerful, not just militarily, but culturally, had cultural self-confidence. And instead of uh, going in and establishing Islamic law, like the United States did in Afghanistan and Iraq over the last few years. Uh, when it, During the colonial period, Western values were brought into those countries. They weren't imposed upon them by force, but they were given a uh, safe way to propagate. And this is why there was not so much jihad terror activity a hundred years ago as there is now. Uh, but nowadays the West has lost its sense of itself. and would never, Obama would never dream of tying USAID to repealing of the blasphemy law because if the Pakistani government wants the blasphemy law, that's their business and he would not uh, dream of interfering or imposing Western values. 
And this is the problem. Unless this changes, and I don't see it changing because the opposition party is no better. Uh, but unless it changes, there's nothing really that can be done. There's plenty that should be done that's obvious, but nothing that's going to be done. And the same can be said about Saudi Arabia, one of the U.S.'s main allies as well. And yet Saudi Arabia is uh, guilty of uh, violating people's uh, human rights all the time. I mean, they, they execute people for apostasy, for witchcraft. In fact, I think they were even... Their, uh, their beheadings uh, were, uh, they were almost rivaling that of ISIS. <laughs> they were trying, I think they had so many beheadings per month uh, that were out of average with uh, the rest of the year. And so in, in Saudi Arabia, there are no churches permitted, no synagogues are permitted to be built, no Hindu temples, no Buddhist temples. The law of the land is Islam. Uh, and so uh, there's another issue here. Saudi Arabia is a huge human rights violator. You know, we are approaching another break. And uh, we, we know we have callers waiting, so I won't ask them to, 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 we won't take a call right now, but we will do that right after the break. But one observation, if I could, just to sneak this in before we go to our break, as I've been making notes, like I say, you know, all the things that are going on with, this, with Islam, this growth, this expansion, it's, it appears to be, in my, from my perspective, continues to grow mm -hmm. into America, you know, and through Europe and, and, uh, and uh, Great Britain. Um, if you compare that to what's going on in our economy in this country, I don't know about Canada so much, but certainly in America, there's, there's so much unrest and mm -hmm. uncertainty. And then we look at our president who's, my goodness, <laughs> you know, volumes of things could be read about, spoken or mm -hmm. uh, written about him, perhaps in more times to come, mm -hmm. about what's going on, how, how this country's changing, even as a result of, the, of his influence or lack thereof. Um, then you have the, the, the Holy Spirit and the move of the Spirit in the Christian church and all these things are um, culminating in this. There's this, there's this swelling up. Of this, there's something going on. There's all these different things happening. Like all these areas are growing and pushing. <laughs> and frankly, it's programs like this that can help us be at least have an area, an, an opportunity to talk about these <laughs> kinds of things and hopefully to do something about it. And we'll, we'll keep that thought. And we, again, thank you for staying with us. We have another half hour left. We're going to go to a quick break. We'll take more callers, and we certainly have room for, for you. If you want to call us at 248-416-1300, we're going to, we'll go to a break, and we'll come right back, and we'll talk again with Robert and Tony. Thank you. Matthew in his gospel says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And we are back. Thank you so much for sticking with us again. The number, 248-416-1300. This last hour has flown right by, and we have uh, a number of things that we've been talking about uh, and we've been listening to, and we're so grateful to have these two men here tonight. And not so much tonight, but also certainly for the years of work that they put into this. And uh, uh, there, are, there is so much apathy and so much ignorance and so much uh, lack of knowledge, and yet you and, and others like you have really made an effort to, to, to bring forth the word and to bring forth the, this information so that people will know. And you do the research, and, I, and, I, and I'm, it's a great privilege just to be, be with you both, you know, in the studio and electronically, and uh, we're excited to 
see what's going to happen. Um, it's amazing what's happening. So, uh, so I just had to chime that in. But, uh, but we do want to continue to uh, uh, ask you to call, and we have some callers here. And I'm not, sure, I'm not going to say who it is because I'm not sure who's up next, but we do have a caller, and what is your name? Hello. Larry. Hello, what's your name? Larry. Larry. What's yes. your question, sir? Thanks for calling. Uh, I'm a Christian, and I've been getting your show for uh, five or six weeks. It was reruns up to a few days ago. But uh, I, uh, uh, I am supported it financially and passing it along to friends and other people. Uh, I was listening to you about uh, Hussein Obama uh, when he took the oath of office. And if you, uh, which he got there by false pretense, by the way, um, if you can get a tape of his uh, swearing in, I think you will find that he kind of slurred his words, that when they swore him in, that he kind of mumbled something there and didn't really uh, commit himself. I love you all in the Lord. Keep up the good work. God bless all of you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I didn't really notice that. I don't know about you, Robert. No, I first I heard of it. Okay. Well, maybe it was just my bad hearing, but if you can get that tape and pay close attention, I think you'll find that his heart wasn't in that. Hmm. Well, I know the first, uh, the first time in 2009, that he took the oath, the Chief Justice, John Roberts, got the oath wrong. Uh, and there's that feedback again. It's, I, I don't know if, it, with some, if you can try to fix that. Anyway, uh, the, I have the sound off. Uh, I don't know what it is. It's just sound coming through on my side. It's very hard to... We'll ask our technicians <laughs> to uh, turn off the microphone if, uh, on, on the caller, if we could. John Roberts, the Chief Justice, got the oath wrong, and Obama took it wrong. And everybody noticed, of course, it was on international television. So the next... Uh, right. No, this was the second swearing in. The second one? Oh, I don't know anything about that one. I don't even think I saw it. Uh, it was too painful to watch. Amen, <laughs> brother. <laughs> All right, well, Larry, thank you for your contribution. I, I, I would like to reiter reiterate tonight's uh, topic, uh, just so we're on the same page here, and I should have mentioned this before, uh, or more frequently perhaps, is does Islam violate basic human rights. So does Islam violate basic human rights is our topic. And thank you for calling, Larry. Appreciate your call and your support. We do definitely appreciate that. And thank you for partnering with us. And we'll, uh, we'll have to keep an eye on, uh, on, on, on that inaugural speech from uh, more the second uh, swearing in. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me get a quick drink here. Um, we do have another caller. Mm. Hello? Who's, who's next? Me? Hello? Hello? Do you hear me? Yes. What's your name? Yes, Shiker. Uh, hello? Hello? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. We, we can. What is your question, sir? Yes. Uh, thank you first uh, for giving me this opportunity, especially with, uh, um, uh, with, um, with Dr. Robert Spencer and my citizenship mate, uh, Tony Casta. And... Uh, uh, actually, uh, I want to say that uh, what's happening by Muslim group, and I don't want to say that these are extremists, because this is uh, what they are doing is true Islam. What they are doing is uh, counteracting the morality of the the kind, the normal lay Muslim. Okay, uh, leading to uh, some of the experts even uh, uh, trying to reformate Islam and giving him a. a, a um, a new uh, image, uh, like uh, especially in the Middle East, uh, because they can read uh, Arabic and they can read uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, so they are trying to to uh, abolish what is uh, read in Sahih al-Bukhari, which counteracts human rights. Even um, the president of Egypt, he is asking to uh, reform Islam or reform the image of Islam. So the question is, is Islam liable to reformation or this will lead to collapse of Islam like 
what Perestroika did to the communism. Okay. So Thank you for your question. Uh, let, me, let me just say that uh, some moderate Muslims, so-called, uh, have tried to make a comparison between the Reformation and Christianity and the so-called reforming movement in Islam today. There's a, a very big difference here because um, the Reformation in Christian history was a return to the, as the model said, ad fontes, back to the sources, back to the fountain, which in the Protestant Reformation was scripture. But if Islam really is going to have a reformation, then it is a return to their scriptures, to the Islamic texts. And so when the uh, Wahhabi school was born, it did exactly that. It said, let's go back to the sources, back to the fountains, back to the Islamic texts. And what have you seen? You have seen the resurgence of this type of jihadi mentality. And, and that is what the sources say. Now, the other problem is Islam cannot be reformed. Why can it not be reformed? How do you reform something that is implicitly perfect? It is the religion of Allah, sent by Allah. It is the complete religion. You cannot reform something that is already perfected. And so it's, it's a fool's errand, really, to try to pursue this reformation of Islam. A true reformation would be to return back to the sources. And this is what we see going on in ISIS. This is exactly what the sources are saying. There's a, as a matter of fact, it's not just implicit, it's explicit. In the Quran, it says in chapter 5, verse 3, This day I have perfected for you your religion, That's right. and right. completed my favor upon you, and have approved for you Islam as religion. So Islam tells the believer in the Quran itself that it's already perfect. So what could possibly be reformed? Moreover, the uh, person who dares to change something is guilty of bida of innovation, which is explicitly rejected as a grave sin. There's the sound problem again, but anyway, I'll just try to press on here. The explicit uh, rejection of the idea of innovation as a sin, as a deviation from the perfection of the Quran and the example of Muhammad. And if the uh, heretic and the apostate is to be put to death, as per the Quran and Islamic law, then it's even worse because not only are you committing uh, heresy, but then you're risking your life to do so. And so very few Muslims are going to be willing to do this. There have been so-called heretics put to death in modern times. Mahmoud Mohammed Taha, in 1985 in Sudan, he uh, taught that the Meccan surahs, which are generally more peaceful, should take precedence over the Medinan surahs, which are more violent. And he was put to death by the Sudanese government as a heretic. Uh, this is what happens. The reformers like this always face this kind of response. Even in our own day, there is an imam in Morocco named Ahmed Asi. And Ahmed Asi, just a few months ago, he taught the same thing. He said it was shameful that Islam was used as a pretext for violence and that uh, the peaceful aspects of it should be made to take precedence over the violent. And he was immediately denounced as a heretic, shunned by his fellow imams. They put out death threats against him, and he's living in hiding. So how are you going to reform when the reformers are, are, are under death threat? And a professor at the University of Nablus, as you know, uh, Robert, when he was uh, talking about the evolution of the Islamic text as something that uh, evolved uh, over time, was thrown out uh, the window. And I think it was a, a three-story building or four-story building and, and badly injured. Uh, yes. And that's because he dared to question the uh, divine origins of the Quran. So the thing is, you know, this, uh, th th these threats of death and this violence against people like Professor Bashir and, and all these others, and Mahmoud, Mah Mahmoud Muhammad Taha and Ahmed Asid, that's the prerequisite, really, for any reformation. It's a very practical thing. When Martin Luther was freeing, fleeing for his life, uh, that could have been the end of it, but when he was given a uh, sanctuary by, uh, I forget the guy's name, but one of the, one of the German princes, mm -hmm. and then he had a place where he could live and move about freely and not be in fear of death all the time, then his movement was able to take root. And this is what is uh, how Islamic reform is cut off at the roots, at, 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 right at the beginning, because these people are immediately victimized, and nobody who's going to stand for them. Uh, no, no German prince in their regard. Uh, also, you're quite right that the Wahhabis represent the real reformation in Islam. They represent going back to the Quran and doing just what the Quran says. 
and they're the most virulent and violent form of Islam in the world today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I will say, uh, Robert, we apologize for any, by the way, any uh, uh, technical issue or audio or so. We're not, we're not really sure what that is, but we're trying to track that it's down. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we live in a noisy world, so uh, unfortunately, we have to deal with some of that. Um, yeah. But but speaking of Islam, uh, any, no. Um, but I would say um, we do have another caller, I believe. And if that caller is there, we'll we'll take the call. And the question. Hello. Do we have a caller? I believe we do. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah. You know, we have one supreme being up in heaven. It would be nice to see all the religions come together as one. And unfortunately, we have, like I said, we have one supreme being. We'd like to see all the religions come together. Can you imagine the peace we would have on this planet? I watched a movie not too long ago with Mark Wahlberg called Shooter. And all these wars are basically over natural resources of different countries. And unfortunately, we have too many people uh, want to rule the world instead of coming together across this country. And the only way things are going to change until all of us realize that we all God's children and we all need to come together as one. And we need to stop these countries from starting wars over natural resources, like oil. Uh, we start more wars than any other country. We go over in other countries and figure out if they got oil, gas, copper, zinc, whatever, and then we remove the people off that land by one means or another. And we only have, uh, what, 130 families that run this planet that are Illuminati. And until we realize and study our history and our culture and realize we only got one supreme being, we will never have peace on this planet until we come together as a people. Because we only got one supreme being up there in heaven. But I was wondering what would it take to make all these religions to come together as one? Well, Robert or Tony? Well, uh, you won't have that simply because uh, all these world religions uh, conflict in some of the major doctrines. Buddhism. I mean, our, our caller said we should all believe in the supreme being. Well, classical Buddhism does not believe in the supreme being. They don't believe that there's a personal God in the universe. It is basically atheistic. Um, and then you've got Hinduism with uh, 330 million gods and so forth. So they don't believe in one supreme being. Um, and so the problem here is that... Uh, it's 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 it comes down to worldview. Um, very various religions cancel each other out. Uh, Christians believe in the Trinity. Islam does not believe in the Trinity, and we can go on and on and on. Uh, and so and so the answer does not lie in. It's not so much the human problem. It's our ideologies. It's the worldview. The worldview of Islam is a totalitarian uh, regime that sees the whole world as the mosque of Allah. It belongs to Allah, and Islam must be supreme over all religions. Robert. That's unfortunate. But hopefully one day people will wake up and they, their thought process will change and come together as one and quit starting wars over natural resources. But anyway, you know, I, I love y'all program. Keep up the good work and maybe your program, maybe you can get on Channel 7, 4, and 2 and we can get everybody involved in the dial, you know, in the conversation. Well, we appreciate your input tonight. Uh, it's David, right? Terry. Yeah, David. David. David, we appreciate your call. I think you have good intentions. Uh, uh, I would say that, uh, uh, sir, uh, love your, your family and love your neighbors and, uh, and uh, definitely uh, serve God and love God. And um, let that, let's, let's all try to do that. How's that? It's a start. Yes, that'd be great. We need one big family reunion. Well, there'll be, uh, that, that's, uh, that's a tall order, sir, but uh, mm. one, one, one person at a time, but it all starts with the person we look at when we look at the mirror, correct? Yeah, but, uh, Michael Jackson made a record call, the man in the mirror, you got to start with yourself. Sir, we appreciate your call, and you know what, we, we're going to move on, but thank you, seriously, call us again, we're going to have another program tonight at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, I'm not sure where you're calling from, but 
Uh, I'm here call, in Detroit. Well, you call us back, all right? And we're going to move on to the next right, caller. All right, I will. Have a safe evening. You have a great evening. Thanks for calling. God bless you. Okay, bye-bye. On that note, we've got one more, or another caller, and maybe two more, but, uh, and who am I speaking with? This is Terry. Terry, how are you? Hey, how you doing? Chris, I wanted to give you some props. It seems like every time we call in, we go right straight to the guests, and you don't get anything, man. I'm just here to, to, to uh, <laughs> they, they felt sorry for me. They said, okay, Chris, we'll put you on the studio. <laughs> no, but, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate you calling us. Uh, how are you tonight, Terry? I'm doing pretty good. I wanted to tell you guys, uh, especially Robert there, uh, what we did here in southeast Illinois um, leading up to these midterms. This is just something for people to think about. Um, we had two different events leading up to it in our local Tax Enough Already uh, group. We brought in Act for America for the second time, mm -hmm. and people's faces are just, they'll just blow your mind because people just don't know what they need to know. And then we had one where we brought in a, a group uh, representative, uh, Mark Fisher, I think his name is Mark, or Dan Fisher, from the 60th District of Oklahoma, and what he did, you guys will like this, he brought in a big, they had a big screen, had a, uh, pre a presentation going on, and he stood next to it, dressed in a colonial uniform, and then put the black robe on, and he was talking about how it was the preachers who stood up and trained the Minutemen, and he, he told real American history, and I even got to hold a, a musket that was used in the Battle of Trent. So we're doing things like that, um, because we're not going to solve this problem in our country or in the world until we solve it at the dinner table. That's just my opinion on it. And when you, the topic tonight, I love this topic because they do violate human rights. Um, Sharia law is its own law. When Keith Ellison swore on the Koran, see, they didn't even bother to tell us. They were all excited that he swore on the Koran, but nobody told you why Thomas Jefferson had that Koran. You know, because of the Barbary pirates. He wanted to know his enemy. So when he swore on that, that was a completely different constitution than the U.S. Constitution, because you guys can speak on this, I know, because it, Sharia law at its core is, is basically sedition to the United States Constitution. And anyway, I appreciate what you guys do, and God bless you. And God, I'm, thank you. I'm trying to spread the word. God bless you. Appreciate that, Terry. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, any comment on that, or? Well, I'd agree wholeheartedly with yeah. what he said. He's, he's absolutely right. Uh, you know, we're forgetting our roots. Uh, the United States and Canada, we're forgetting the, the rock from which we've been hewn. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to, if we don't learn from history, as the philosopher Santayana said, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. And so I think it's really important that we go back and understand what made this nation great. It was the Judeo-Christian foundation that understood that human beings are made in the image of God. They have inalienable rights. And that those rights, uh, as Veterans Day approaches, and in Canada we call it Remembrance Day, mm -hmm. and so does Great Britain, these were men and women who fell in battle to protect our freedoms. Mm -hmm. And Sharia law is chipping away and will destroy those freedoms that were so mm -hmm. hard fought for. We, uh, we appreciate that, Tony, and we are getting close to the end of our program mm -hmm. tonight. We have another caller, though. We'd like to sneak that in if we could. Uh, who am I speaking with? Hello? We have a caller. Hello, yes. Uh, what is your name, sir? My name is Todd. Todd. Hey, Todd. What's your question? Yes. Uh, Go ahead, Todd. Okay, I have to turn my TV down a little bit. Um, Thank you. My question is, I live over in Buffalo, New York, and uh, as far as the human rights issue, that's what we're talking about? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Um... Well, like I'll go to the grocery store and I'll have my girlfriend with me and she's black. And on more than quite a few occasions, we've had like uh, the female Muslim women in their burqas. They always run in a group. They slam into her with the grocery card. You know, they always uh, like try to make life miser miserable on her. And I think it's because we're a mixed race couple. And I don't understand what gives them the right to make this kind of a scene or just, I mean, this is the United States. And they're actually doing this over here in Buffalo. Uh, and then all of a sudden they cornered her one day, like the men cornered my girlfriend one day, 
and they started going off on her, and the only thing that saved her, because apparently the guys were starting to clench their fists like they wanted to give her a beat down, uh, was a bunch of other, like, men came up and, you know, said, you hit her, we're going to take you out and beat the hell out of you. So I just want to know what the situation is and, you know, why should that action be tolerated here in the United States and how can we let them get away with that? Because well, that's a violation of our human rights. Okay, it we're going to let Robert answer that question. It shouldn't be tolerated in the United States, but here again you have uh, elected officials who've compromised with these groups, these Islamic supremacist advocacy groups, and they uh, are not willing to confront uh, a, a lot of uh, petty violence and intimidation done by Muslims in the United States, and this is a situation that's only going to get worse. I would guess, not knowing the situation, but from what you've described, it may be that the Muslims who confronted, who, who are being rude to your girlfriend or your, uh, or your wife, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the relationship, but in any case, the, 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 the thing is, they might be black American converts, and black American converts are uh, usually appealed to on the basis of the, the <coughs> excuse me, the false idea that Islam is the original religion of the black people, and the original religion of the Africans, and that somebody who is uh, black and not Muslim is therefore a race traitor. And somebody who's black and is has a white partner is even more of a race traitor uh, because it's a, a matter of black solidarity and identity to stay with blacks and to be a Muslim. Uh, Islam is, contrary to this, actually a very racist ideology that exalts Arabs above others. And it's kind of paradoxical that uh, black Muslims are persecuted in the Sudan, violently so, uh, by Arabs and are discriminated against by Arabs all around the Islamic world and yet then Muslims come here and appeal to black Americans on the basis of uh, racial solidarity it's uh, it's it's uh, here again yet another cynical and deceptive exercise we were talking about Islamophobia earlier and the idea that uh, that Islam is the original religion of black people and that it is not racist is just as cynical and just as deceptive as the concept of Islamophobia Indeed so, and uh, the fact that uh, even today, uh, I think one of the standard uh, Arabic words, uh, I'm just, uh, let me just comment on that, uh, um, one of the standard Arabic words for, for black people uh, is the word abd, it's the word slave, uh, and, and uh, you know, you heard of the Nation of Islam and, and how Malcolm X changed his name, he didn't want to be known by his so-called white Christian name, uh, and yet when Malcolm X actually joined Sunni Islam, uh, he was summarily killed by, by members of, of uh, Elijah Muhammad's group known as the Nation of Islam. Hmm. Um, but uh, it's, it's ironic, as Robert said, that when Islam invaded Africa, uh, they were the ones who engaged in the slave trade long before the Christian nations did. And even to this day, slavery continues in Islam. This is something that is hardly ever touched upon by a Western government. Slavery continues to be practiced in the Islamic world. Hmm. We... Uh, okay. Okay, can I, can I interrupt for a moment? You know what, we, we would like, we would certainly like to get, do that, but we only have four minutes left in our program, uh, uh, and we're going to have to move on. Uh, but okay. we are, we are going to be on again another half hour, so perhaps you want to call right. back at that number? Um, I, four, four I might. I was just going to make it quick. Um, after serving six years in the military, uh, the people that are doing this, they are of um, Islamic, you know, they, they're, they remind me of the Taliban. Basically, the women are dressed in burqas. They're the very light shade. The men, the men that were there have the full beard. They, you know, they look right out of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. All right, well, I appreciate your feedback, and thank you for serving in our military and being a committed uh, soldier. And, uh, and thank you for tuning in and calling in from Buffalo, New York. And it's amazing that this program, uh, it can be, you can be watched anywhere in the world. Yeah. And we're getting callers from the local area, from, from all over the country, and perhaps all over the world. And that's the power of uh, the technology that we have available to us, not only this program, but certainly anyone. But we, uh, we do appreciate all the folks that have, I'll just go right into a, a, a thank you again for all the folks that have uh, continued to 
uh, historically supported our, our network here and continue to do so because without you, we won't have shows like this. Uh, and this is, uh, we're like a whisper in the wilderness. There's, a, there's turmoil, there's difficulty, there's all kinds of crazy things going on in this world and there's so much deceit and so much misinformation. And yet you have here, we're not perfect, certainly, but we are defenders of the truth, which is the truth. And it's worth standing for and fighting for. And, and, and by being a part of this program, by supporting this ministry, you're helping to promote truth. You're helping to get the word out. You're helping to, to, to share with people. And by the way, I'll just interject here. All the things that we're talking about from about Islam and the Muslim people, we don't hate the Muslim people. We certainly don't. We love the Muslim people, but certainly there is much, uh, there's many, many things that are going wrong that are horrible, despicable, and evil that needs to be stopped. And perhaps, perhaps by having programs, programs like this, that can start. We have a couple minutes left. Robert and Tony, I'm going to get out of the way, and there's anything else you'd like to say before we're done tonight? Well, there's other areas we, we could have touched on, but we didn't because there's so much to cover. I mean, we right. could have talked about the uh, inequality uh, between Muslims and non-Muslims. The Quran makes it very clear that Muslims are the best of all peoples and that uh, the, the people of the book who reject Muhammad are the vilest or the worst uh, of all creatures. And we can go on and on and on. Uh, the, the bottom line is Islam violates basic human rights. Mm -hmm. Sharia law is completely incompatible uh, with uh, Western democracy. And Robert, last word. We do have, uh, you know, you, you said very early in the program, Chris, uh, that uh, we're on the winning side. And that's absolutely true. There's no doubt about it. But we have to remember, and I think I find among many Christians a certain complacency mm -hmm. in that regard. And when I speak to Christian groups, I often hear people say, well, you know, Jesus is going to come back and uh, defeat all these people. And you know that that there's no doubt that Jesus is going to come back and there will be the consummation of all things but there's no guarantee that the United States is going to continue to exist until that time in peace and uh, stability there's no guarantee that Christianity will remain as the dominant religion here or anywhere else uh, it's important to remember that what we consider to be the heart of the Islamic world today the Middle East North Africa and so on those were Christian lands that had been Christian for uh, over 600 years before the Arab armies conquered and Islamized them. And the same thing could happen here if we continue in our willful ignorance and complacency that uh, dominates the West's response to the Islamic Jihad threat. And so uh, it's, it's good, you know, thank God for ABN, thank God yeah, that uh, yeah. you guys are there and getting the word out. Uh, and I hope that uh, people will consider donations to ABN at this time as uh, they're direly needed. The mainstream media is not telling the truth about this. The government's not telling the truth about this. And uh, the stakes are very high. Mm -hmm. We could yeah. end yeah. up living in a situation where it is, uh, like in Roman times, illegal to be a Christian and people risk their lives to go to church on Sunday. And then it would be welcome to what it's like to be a Christian today in the lands controlled by the Islamic State or in uh, areas of Egypt and Nigeria and Pakistan. And so uh, complacency is uh, a great foe, and it's, it's, it's right up there with the willful ignorance as being the things that could very well do us in at this time. And so uh, here again, thank God for ABN. God bless you both. Thank you so much. You and at this time, we will sign off for tonight's program. Thank you so much for watching. Continue to tune in. We've got more programming coming up. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Thank you.